Hi, everyone. Just one second. Okay, so I got, I found the pen. So these slides are up on the website. Just one second. Oh, shoot. Just one second. My iPad is out of battery. All right, there you go. Um, let's, let's get started. Oh, 
Okay, yeah, sorry for the uh, delay. And also uh, last minute change to Zoom lecture. So um, as you know, uh, uh, first announcement is you already did quiz 07, but we'll have quiz again this Thursday. And we'll have uh, four more quizzes, including this Thursday's quiz. And th they will count towards your grade. I said that this will be 5% of your final grade. So please be prepared for that. Although I'll try to give you enough time. I think last time I gave you 10 minutes and I'll probably give you 10 minutes this time as well. So you'll have enough time and it's open book. So I don't think you will have to really um, memorize something. It's more of um, you have to understand the lecture so that you can find things that you need to. And next is that assignment three is due next Tuesday. So it was up since last Tuesday. And number three is that the project proposal submission deadline is today. So, well, you might think this is like too soon, but this is very, uh, very short. I would say um, it's not even assignment. It's, uh, it's very uh, something that you can do very, very quickly, especially if you're working on something. So it's just an abstract. And it doesn't even have to be a complete abstract. It can be a, some, you can have some placeholders. Like for instance, if you're still not sure of your final results, then you can say, um, we outperform previous system by XX percent and you fill out these XX later. So don't worry about the um, quality. It's more of a, the, 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 uh, the purpose of this submission is that I don't want you to basically work on final project. And at the end, you find that your final project option is not, final project is not appropriate for the, uh, the, this class's final project. For instance, if it's not related to NLP or if, for instance, um, I think, as I'll say, the next announcement, maybe it's it, it's something that you're not you cannot submit to conference. So, which means actually for many of you who haven't or who doesn't plan to submit to the uh, the NLP conferences, I don't think final project is a good option. So please do assignments. Um, and. Um, Final project will be graded as if it is a real conference submission by the TAs. So a grade of one to five will be given, okay? So, and here actually, maybe I said that 4.0 or above is 100%, but I thought maybe that's too harsh. So I'm changing it to 3.5 or above. And if you get 3.5 in NLP conferences, usually, it's still borderline and also it's kind of leaning towards acceptance though. Um, many of uh, power papers get accepted, but also some papers get rejected 3.5 is. Uh, 3.0 usually it's quite hard, but it's kind of borderline, but 3.0 will get 90%. And every time you get a 0.5 lower, you will get 10% lower in your final grade. I mean, your final project grade until 50%, which is 1.0. So if you submit something that's reasonable, I mean, not reasonable, but something that's at least a paper, then you will get at least 50%. But um, yeah, please uh, be aware that we have this grading schema. We're gonna use the same, um, the reviewing rubric for the, uh, these NLP papers, NLP conferences. Okay, so any question? Oh, is it? Okay. Yeah, if that's the case, then, huh, let me see. <laughs> yeah, you're right. Okay, my bad. I think it never got, okay, wait. I'll change it right now. That's really weird.
So I just changed and a link, the link is here. So any question? Thanks for pointing this out. Okay, then um, let's get to the uh, today's lecture. So now it's about time to talk about language model, which I think has been one of the hottest topics in recent three to four years. Um, of course, but we'll start from the real language model and then we'll move towards more of a language model used for transfer learning. Okay, so what is language model? So I think some people might get confused what language model is because I think the context which language model is used is these days is not, well, similar to what it was I think like tens of years ago or 10 years ago. And of course, I don't want to say that a language model should be this because I think the definition also kind of changes, especially language model itself is, I think it's not a very good term, but uh, let's at least try to define what language model is um, formally. So in fact, language model is actually a um, probabilistic model that defines the probability distribution over strings of text. So it basically, it's asking a question like, for instance, um, what's the probability of, um, hello world. And that's it, actually, uh, that's all about language models. So it's quite, well, absurd because why would you need that? Why would you need to know what the probability of uh, certain sentences and in fact, it's not only not, not useful, but also the probability will be very small because it's like asking someone um, how, what the probability is, you know. And then you don't really need that, right? For your every, everyday life. But there's actually reason for it. And the reason is that if you actually can define this formally, how small it is, I mean, how, even if it's very small number, what you can do is now you can do a, dip, a few different things. And one of them, including actually most important thing is the, you can actually define the probability of the most likely next word given previous words. So how does it work? Well, the, the uh, probability of a next word given the previous words will be like this, right? And we know that the Bayes theorem, this can be, this is equivalent to the probability of, you know, what we just saw here. And divide by the probability of um, everything but the last word. This is like a very simple theorem, but then now we see that if, if we can define an arbitrary text probability, then we can actually, do, uh, we can find out what the probability of the next word given the previous words. And what can you do with this? Well, you can now generate text. You can iteratively create text. And that's like one of the most useful, well, uh, use cases and also actually the computing the probability itself of a text is also useful too. Uh, sometimes if you are trying to actually say, for instance, see if a certain sentence is grammatically correct or uh, spelling wise correct. But I think it's more useful to think of it as a autoregressive or iterative word generation. Okay. And then uh, one important thing is how we measure the accuracy or I mean, how good a language model is. And we cannot use accuracy because that, that way then um, we, can, we can of course try to use accuracy, but the language model has very high, I would say variance, which means that it will, it will be very unlikely that a model will get exactly 
the target text correct, right? Because even if there is a perfect language model, there is always different ways to say something given the previous words, right? So uh, it's really hard to actually measure some language model with the accuracy. I mean, even if they're using this next word thing, and of course, language, language model itself is a distribution, not conditional model. So you cannot really evaluate that. Um, well, unless you have exactly the, um, the target probability of some text, but that's impossible to compute, right? So what people use is some, something called perplexity. And this is basically the inverse probability of the test set normalized by the number of words. So basically you have a target text W1 to Wn, and you want to measure what the probability of this words give up by your model. So it's actually um, here, it, these are not variables. These W1 and Wn are not variables. They are actually um, the exact words in the test set. And then you compute this probability then what that means is then because the test set is something that you think is very likely, I mean, it's actually uh, probably a text obtained from some corpus. So it is actually something that exists, which means your model should actually have a high probability of su such existing text, right? So you want this probability to be high, but then still this number will be very small, right? So. Uh, it's really hard to compare those small numbers. So what, so what you do is actually you normalize by the number of words first. So that's actually the one over n part. And what happens if you do this? Well, suppose that, for instance, um, your this is something like, for instance, uh, because this will be multi multiplication of um, very small probabilities. And suppose that this is something like, um, one over 10 to the power of N. And it's just saying that each word has a probability of one over 10, and then you just um, exponentiate it by N. <clears throat> and then um, if you do this, this will be just simply one over 10. And this will be a very small number, right? This is, uh, the number here is very small. The, this is very small, but this is manageable, right? So that's the, what this normalization does um, by having this, um, well, square root with n or having the nth roots. So it's kind of averaging multiplical, multiplicatively of the probabilities. And then after that, you actually perform this um, negation here. I mean, not negation on the uh, probability itself, but then on the exponentiation side. And what it does is then now, you are now working on some number below one, right? But then now you're working on some number above one because you're making it reciprocal. You're inversing it. And the good thing about that is that you're gonna now see some big numbers, which is probably mean, which probably means that the perplexity is too high. And if you have small numbers, then your perplexity will be low. So if you're actually doing negative here, then this will be 10, right? So, you can interpret the perplexity as whether a certain model on average predicts, predicts that each word in the test set is one in that perplexity. Here, it's 10, right? So it's one in 10. The probability of each word in the, in the uh, test set is one in 10. So you can think of uh, the, you can interpret perplex that way. So. So what does that mean then? Uh, that means then actually, what's the worst case of a certain language model given vocab size of V? Well, if you have vocab size of V, then it means then you can actually at least give the very naive way of estimating the probability of each word to be one over V, right? Because it still will be 
uh, appropriate probability distribution. So you can just define that uh, P over any W I is just one over B. Then everyone agrees that this is a valid probability distribution, right? Because you just basically have then um, 1.0, right? Then what will be a probability of a, any word sequence? And we're assuming actually naive bias, which means um, it doesn't depend on the previous word at all. Oh, I did freeze, okay. This is very annoying. One second. Hmm. Okay, so let me um, explain again. So I was talking about um, very naive model. Suppose that you just basically have a WI given whatever is always one over V. It's a very naive model, but you know that this is actually a valid probability distribution because we know that the summation of this will be 1.0, right? Then this model, what, what would be the perplexity of any test set of length n? That's actually, you can easily see that will be just, I mean, first probability of any sequence is one over v to the power of n. Then what is perplexity? Well, one over v n, but then you basically have negative one over n. So you cancel out n and then you make negation of one basically makes one over v to v. So this is just v. So that's actually very important because any model that has a perplexity of v is basically no better than you know, just this kind of a naive model that doesn't know anything. So um, that's one important thing. Your vocab size is like your, um, I would say upper bound of your perplexity of any language model. Best cases, well, well, I mean, it's very hypothetical, but then suppose that this domain is very deterministic, de deterministic and the probability you can guess the test set to be 1.0, then what is a 1.0 to the power of one over negative n? It's just 1.0, right? So the lower bound is actually 1.0. You can let go be below 1.0, of course, because that doesn't make sense by definition. So the perplexity will be always between 1.0 and v. I mean, you, it can go above v, if you actually, for instance, um, get it always wrong, then actually your perplexity will be infinite. But then, I mean, if you just have a probably, you have a probability distribution that has a entire probability mass on a wrong word every time, then your, your actually probability of tested will be zero, right? Then zero to the power of one, negative one over n is actually infinite. So your perplexity will be infinite in that case. But that's the worst case, but then there is no, of course, value to it because you can always achieve V, perplexive V very easily. Any question? Well, it depends on how you put it. I mean, upper bound, yeah, it, it is upper bound, I would say, um, in terms of a useful language model, but then it is possible that your language model actually goes above V, but then that it's actually worse than a very naive model that I just told about, told you about. 
So technically, there is no strict upper bound of perplexity. But then, um, but then you can you should think of V as upper bound because uh, if you go above that, then your language model is basically useless. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, I mean, actually I saw a few, uh, for instance, mistakes. Let's say in some domains, your V can be very small, like 10 or 15. And then let's say you create a language model that actually um, gets something like 17 of perplexity. And that's actually very good for domain that has very, very big, big vocab, right? But then we have very small vocab in this domain, then your the perplexity of 17 is very actually useless, but then, um, you might think that's actually very good because you think of uh, perplexity in the large corpus and with large vocab. So it's something that you, you should be careful about. Okay, that, that really, really depends on the, uh, okay, the question from uh, uh, Tong Yol is that which PP value is regarded reasonable for a nice work language model? It really depends on the, uh, what kind of, evaluation metric we use. As I said, uh, it also it depends on V and every, and then also what kind of text it is. But then these days, as far as I know, um, well, it doesn't go above 100, definitely, whatever the text corpus is. And in um, like, for instance, like uh, people use like, for instance, wiki text for evaluation set. Um, I don't remember exactly the numbers, but then you can think of it as something like 30 is at least it's, it's I mean, it's reasonable in many cases. And if you, if, if your language model's perplexity is 30, that means that the language model predicts the next word. I mean, it basically have a prediction of the distribution of the next word. And basically there will be a few options. And um, it, it was roughly, I think you can think of it as a, you usually can actually finalize your option to be uh, one of the 30 words if it's perplexity 30. I think that's one way to think of it, yeah. Because V, a uh, perplexity V is that your option is one of V words, which is obvious, right? Okay, so, but it's important to note that the measuring perplexity is very, you have to do it really carefully because it's actually uh, very easy to cheat um, depending on how you set it up. So um, it's very important to make sure that the testing environment is exactly the same. So next is the um, language, uh, one kind of language model that has been used very, uh, a lot Actually, it's still used these days, So, um, which is n-gram language model. But then we can first talk about the one-gram language model, which is also called unigram language model. So the unigram language model basically tells you how likely is each individual word to appear. So first of all, we can actually define the probability of entire test word sequence with the multiplication of these probabilities. And this is actually exact equality. This is by bias theorem that these are actually exact equality. So that's actually an important thing um, because some people, I think we talk about this in the sec to sec too. Um, some people think this is approximation, but actually not. This is not approximation. This is exact equality. But what the approximation happens actually here. This, so this approximation is made by the Unigram language model. The fact that, well, we said that W2 given W1, we are, let's say for instance, we're looking into this public distribution, but we, okay, well, I don't think that W2 really depends on W1. We just remove this. And I also say W3 doesn't really depend on anything in the, in the, in the past, so it just removes this and removes everything. And then basically this turns into PW1, PW2, dot, 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 PWN. So 
this basically is unique language model. Okay. So the good thing about this is then this is basically can also think of this naive bias because uh, you basically have no dependency on anything else but the current word. And the good thing about this is that um, you can just have a probability distribution of the um, a certain word, just one word, and then you can define the probability distribution of every text sequence. But what's the disadvantage? This is not apparently accurate because it doesn't consider context at all. So you might want to then think about having a, well, how about making the word depend on just the previous word? That may be the, the two previous words, but then just the previous word. So that's actually called bygone language model, apparently. And in fact, um, this is very simple, right? Because um, let's say we have a W3, then we just say that this only depends on W2, but not W1. And if you have WN, we only depend it make it depend on WM minus one and nothing else. And the how, and you might wonder why is this bigram and why is this unigram? The reason is that how you compute each probability is actually counting the unigram. So here you have to now have a, you have to define WI for every word, right? And this I is just simply count of uh, WI given the, um, well, here, what we're, what we're trying to count is in the training corpus, right? So basically the, um, you want to count every occurrence, right? So I'm, I'm just actually putting the star mark here to count the every occurrence of the words, any word. But how about then the bigram? Well, you have to now define wi given wi minus one. Right, and this is just simply counting um, count of uh, wi minus one w given count of wi minus one. Right, so basically you are counting this bigram. This is a bigram over the count of unigram. So that's why this is bigon language model. And then probably you can guess what the trigon language model is or n-gram language model is. So here's a quick definition. Obvious, right? So in n-gram language model, you're obtaining the occurrence of particle n-grams over the occurrence of its sub n minus one gram, okay? Okay, so question from Juno is that when you say context, does it mean both the order and the words that appear before a given word? Yes, so of course, actually it's a good point. Not just the words, but then also their order is important because that will also actually define the meaning of the, the previous words. So I think you're right, it should be end. Okay. All right, so I'm gonna actually talk about Laplace smoothing before we go into break, okay? And then let's go to, actually, let's just cover up the neural language model and NLP roadmap. Yeah, we started a bit late, so probably we'll have a break a bit late. So there are actually a few problems with this n-gram language model. Um, and actually one of the biggest issues is that well, what if the count of a certain n-gram is zero? And that actually is very bad because that means, well, if your corpus that you're trying to test your perplexity has that n-gram, then its probability will be zero entirely. Because remember that perplexity is just the negative one over n of the probability and the probability will be zero if any of the its worst seconds is considered to be zero. So I, this is a very important point. So let me know if you didn't understand this.
So, and that's very bad because then your language model, whenever you actually see any um, unseen biogram or trigram, anything, then it will actually have zero probability. Prob zero probability. And that's a problem. So in order to actually handle these issues, and this only happens in the engram language models, it doesn't happen in the neural language models, but and in order to resolve this issue, people use something called smoothing. I'm just actually talking about one kind of smoothing because we're mostly working in neural language models. So I don't want to go over all kinds of smoothing. There are actually very different kinds of smoothing. But then one way is to one way to prevent this is that, for instance, you can assume that there is an implied count of one for every bigram or ngram, whatever your language model is. If your language model is bigram language model, then uh, you have an implied count of every bi bigram. So what that means is that if you're trying to compute W2 given W1, remember this definition, right? This is a, the definition we saw here, right? But then we are afraid that this count might be um, zero. So we want it to be non-zero for every, whatever the biogram is. So we define the Laplace, Laplace smooth probability by adding one to every occurrence, I mean, every count of biograms. So even if this becomes zero, you still have one. And because you now have bigger values in the numerators, you also have to increase your common denominator, which you use to actually divide the um, numerator by, by V. And why is it V? Because we know that this W2 will be, there will be actually, it will be coming from V. So there will be V times occurrence of W2. So now you add V for this bar gamma plus probability distribution. But again, there are many other kinds of smoothing. And if you're using neural language model, probably you didn't have to worry too much about this kind of smoothings. But that being said also, um, in fact, the Engram language model is still being used in many, many places, especially when the inference latency is important Then the Engram language model, you cannot beat the Engram language model because Engram language model is basically just a hashing or basically just access, memory access, there is no computation really involved compared to the neural language model. So for instance, when you're typing things and if you want it to be really fast on the um, you know, error correction or next word prediction, then you might want to consider anagram language model. But still these days, I think we have very good, um, well, say GPUs or um, accelerators dedicated for neural models, like for instance, iPhones, your engine. So we probably still are, I think, using any language model, but I think we're also slowly moving towards neural language models for many applications. So there's a question again, uh, is there a reason for having count and V separate? Isn't V defined based on the given corpus? Um, I'm not sure I understood your question. V is actually just a uh, universal per certain language model. So first of all, oh no, no. Yeah, it's a, it's basically your given language model first. So you, you first of all, I mean, to be more exact actually, you have a training corpus. Your training corpus has basically um, counts, right? Of certain biograms and uh, unigrams. And you can create a language model from that corpus. But then you want to create a Laplace language model in that case, then you basically um, want to define the model this way. So V is not equal to count W1. It's actually um, just V. No, actually, not even actually n-grams. It's actually just a vocab. It's actually just the uh, unigram vocab, vocab size. The reason why is because how you define this uh, probability distribution here is conditional. So actually, I think it, it's actually quite natural that you uh, have some confusion over, over this because 
Um, here we're defining the probability distribution conditionally. It's not actually the probability of bigram. So that's why it's actually quite confusing that you're adding V not, um, because you, you have a, a W1 is fixed here. That's why you don't have to add actually, um, that's why V is actually just the unigram, um, I mean, number of uh, vocab size, not the uh, number of uh, n-grams or bigrams. So if you were actually doing, trying to do something on W1, W2, not the conditional probability that, as you said, probably you will have to do something like that. V will be the total number of uh, bigrams. But then here we're actually doing conditional, then that's, that's why it's actually also quite doable because, um, so that's why Laplace is not really, I would say, um, it's actually how you would use Laplace's um, you will actually will, in many cases, you will use this in a, uh, well, autoregressive way, or I mean, iterative way. So basically, that plus can be defined, easily defined by W2 given W1, but then you cannot really define this easily with W1 comma W2. Um, I mean, you can still do that, but then um, it's easier to do this way. So that's that's why then we, when we have the plus probability that uh, you can just try to, define W2, W1, W2 with the P Laplace of a W2 given W1 and times P, P, by PW1. And this is uh, something separate, right? Of course, you can also do Laplace again with W1 as well, right? P of W1, I'm saying. So this both can be Laplace. But then uh, what I'm trying to say is that uh, we're not directly computing this, this um, language model. Good questions though, very good questions. Any question? Any other question? All right, so now we're going to neural language model. And actually there is not much to, much, much to talk about because actually just, um, Sick to sick without encoder. So um, these days everyone uses transformer. So you can think of it as just transformers decoder without its encoder. So just one slide I think explains everything. Um, so that's a good thing because in sick to sick you have always an input, but then in the language model you can think of it as uh, having no input but just trying to generate from the start. If you have some words to begin with and that you want to generate the next word, then you can just put these words in the first few slots of the decoder and then try to predict the next word. You can also, of course, try to put these words in the um, encoder side, but then um, I think it's, uh, well, technically we can talk about the difference between those two approaches, but then um, in, uh, theoretically there isn't much difference. But empirically, there is some difference between putting the input to the encoder and putting the input to the uh, decoder side when you're trying to generate the next words. Okay, so this basically concludes everything in task formulation and model that we wanted to cover in this class. In fact, um, we have uh, two more lectures left it's not the end of this class though. We have a, actually a few more things to talk about in the transfer learning, but, but we will have uh, actually four more lectures left. And in the last lecture will be just more of a summing up and more of a recent trend. Um, the, the other three lectures, which will be basically next three lectures will be in fact, I think three models that every NLP researcher should know these days, which is I think BERT, T5 and GPT-2. So we're gonna cover that in depth, one, one for each class. And then after that, we're gonna actually have a very, um, I will say um, some, uh, we'll have a last class that basically sums up everything and try to talk about a few trends recently. We're not going into too much into like, for instance, GPT-3 or really recent ones. I'm going to reserve that for probably, um, I think upper level class that we might um, have next semester. 
or not. So, okay, let's have a five minute break until um, 9.52 and let's come back and I'll actually go over uh, transfer learning. See you in five minutes. All right, welcome back. So let's get started with the, um, I think, 
I would say. The probably the um, most exciting part, which is transfer learning, or I think uh, there are several ways to really do transfer learning, but most popular one, pre-training and fine-tuning these days. So let's first talk about the transfer learning. So what is um, transfer learning? So it's basically the idea of uh, transferring the knowledge obtained in one task for doing another task. So if you actually um, go back to 2012, in 2012, um, it was basically, it's usually considered as the beginning of, um, I would say, deep learning, where the AlexNet, it beated every other non-neural models, which was very carefully designed. And AlexNet was just simply a bunch of CNN layers. And then basically it was super effective. It was just basically outperforming everything else. And then since then people were now delving into how to use these real nets for doing different tasks, not just um, classification, which is you know, classifying each image into whether it's cat or dog, but going into more complicated things, for instance, object detection, whether uh, basically figuring out where each object is and what the object is. So it's more useful, for instance, for um, many different applications, including, um, for instance, um, you know, self-driving car, And of course, other things too, like um, I think people, you have maybe used um, things like YOLO, for instance. These are object detection models. And in the 2013-2014, uh, people were wondering um, what would be the best way to create object detection model, especially given that the data set for object detection model is, its size is relatively small compared to classification largely because object detection is harder to collect more data. Whereas classification is, it's easy to scale this up, right? Because this is um, relatively something that you can label very fast. And what people found, it's, it's actually quite astonishing if you think about it these days. In the, okay, so my bad, there's this like uh, overlap. Um, it's detection, by the way, detection. In a detection model. So what people found is that, let's say you want to create this detection model, which is also a bunch of uh, layers. But then what people tried is just like, you know, doing kind of brain surgery or brain transplant. They were wondering what happens if they bring the the CN layers trained on the uh, classification and bring that to image detection, object detection. But of course the task is different. So it's more of a, you bring this model and then initialize the, I mean, basically use those parameters that were already tuned on classification and use those parameters instead of the um, randomly initialized values so so basically this vgg16 thing this is these parameters are from the classification model called vgg16 but then other parameters are initially randomly initialized these are all randomly initialized and then you just basically have now uh, some randomly initialized portions and you have some initialized portions with, from the image classification task. And you just train these things all together. And what people found is that actually really amazingly that works much better than just initial, randomly initializing everything. So that was like one of the first successful case of uh, transfer learning from classification to detection. Basically what you learned, what the model learned from the classification helps a lot in the detection task because intuitively they have some common ability
from the human's perspective, right? So it actually does for the models too. And it's worth noting that actually supervised learning and transfer learning are, well, I mean, this is called transfer learning because you're transferring some knowledge from another task. And that's actually a different from the fully supervised learning because in fully supervised learning, you're just training on the target task. Whereas in transfer learning, you're somehow using the whatever you learn from another task. And I think it's supervised learning is very simple in, in mathematical terms because it's just the maximum likelihood estimation. But uh, transfer learning is a little tricky because, well, you know, you're actually, your model was trained on some, uh, some another objective, which is different from your actual objective. And then you basically now deviate from the uh, old objective to the current objective. And then now you're saying that it just works better somehow. And that's actually kind of a, quite, um, I would say, it's not weird. I mean, it's intuitively makes sense. It makes sense because humans also learn that way, but it's quite difficult to put that in mathematical terms. Right. So now we're entering some things that may be mathematically not super clear, but still works. So you might uh, ask like, okay, so then what happened? How about the NLP side? Um, did NLP also had some transfer learning in 2013, 2014 or 2015? And in fact, uh, yes, I think we can say they did. The NLP community had and in fact, the word embeddings is actually one of a um, very classic example that works in a similar way. I think you already used this in your first assignment. So now you know that the word embeddings actually is um, something that you can use to help your model train or achieve better accuracy. And remember that you, you, you basically just copied the word embedding weights from Glove or BERT and then you basically just initialize your word embedding with those. You might want to freeze it, or sometimes you actually tune it with the uh, rest of the model, but still, um, I, the idea is quite sim similar, right? So in fact, these were very um, effective in the early NLP days, I mean, deep NLP days. And they're very easy to use because um, in fact, e easier than even the image domain side, because in the image domain, still you have to compute something on top of the uh, input image because input image changes every time. But then these cases, in this case, it doesn't have to be computed every time because, well, we have a fixed number of possible words. So if you are, if you just store all the word embeddings in your memory or in your storage, then you can just bring them for each word that you see in your um, in your target task. And that, that's like one of the uh, biggest advantages of uh, word embeddings. And how about the uh, whether you want to fine tune or not? It's actually um, just like in the image domain too, because some people in the image domain also try with not fine tuning the VGG16 part at all. And sometimes they saw that that's actually more, it works better. Uh, one of the examples actually is in, for instance, like uh, things like, um, I mean, not always, but sometimes actually people didn't fine tune it. And in the word embeddings is exactly the same. In fact, there is actually, a, there are a few clear advantages of not fine tuning word embeddings when you're bringing them. Um, because let's say that um, you, you basically have a say, um, 100,000 words obtained from glove. And then suppose that in your training for the target task, you only see observed like 70,000 of them. Then how about the other 30,000? You have never observed them during training. So basically those factors will not change at all. But then the 70,000 words will change during training. So after a training is done, then the words that you have observed during training have shifted from where they were, but then the words that you haven't observed in during training are staying there because they never receive any gradient update. Then basically there is some now discrepancy, right? Between these words, especially if you now start to see some words that were not seen during training, then there will be some discrepancy. So um, 
actually sometimes people actually just freeze these words and they think that works better. But I don't think there is a very um, clear win clear win between these two options or strategies. I think one strategy works better than the other sometimes, and I think the other way in other cases. And um, and people are wondering what would be the image classification equivalent in NLP. Yes, of course, word embedding works, but then word embedding is not quite um, sufficient to do any really task that has a lot of uh, context information involved because word embedding doesn't care about the context at all. And people actually initially thought that the text classification could be just like image people did image classification for the pre-training, maybe text classification is also good for pre-training, but they it was empirically not so effective. And there, of course, people were thinking about why that's the case. And now I think we know the reason. Um, the reason was actually that the, uh, well, I mean, it's still conjecture, but then basically, unlike image classification, text classification is not hard enough. It doesn't mean that we can get 100% in this task. It's just that the, the, um, the amount of uh, information that's readily available is uh, in the text classification is uh, relatively more, uh, much more useful than the image classification that the model just tries to use those useful cues, very easy cues rather than the any complex uh, contextual information. These useful cues are actually usually the semantics of the words. You can, if you can just basically ref, uh, infer from the semantics of the individual words to determine the semantics of the entire uh, text if it, it's just classification. And I mean, that's like a one reason why. And I don't think, of course, um, we can really exactly explain why um, image classification works, but text classification doesn't work well. But I think uh, one of ways to explain that is that the text classification is relatively uh, too easy compared to image classification um, in terms of uh, what the model has to learn internally. I think there is some evidence uh, supporting this claim or this, um, I would say, uh, idea. For instance, um, actually, this is like one of work that um, um, that I was I was also involved. That uh, if you actually train a model on question answering, for instance, squad, and then you actually fine tune that on some text classification task or some other test, actually works pretty well. So it actually has a very effective transfer learning accuracy. So, and question answering is probably harder than text classification in many cases. So I think that was one of the empirical evidences that um, the transfer learning works only when um, the, the, the source task is difficult enough. And in fact, there was a good task that was hard enough and even better than image domain, the amount of data is available. I mean, the amount of data available is very large, which was actually actually language model. And language model is the good thing about language model compared to image classification is that these are self-supervised, which means there is practically unlimited training data on the web. And it's also hard enough in fact, it's too hard that it's impossible to get it exactly correct, but then it's hard enough that, and also it, the model probably learns some contextual cues. They have to utilize every possible contextual cues to guess the next word right. So language model was, uh, now people now start to see the language model actually is the image classification equivalent in NLP starting in probably as early as 2017. Which, which means basically compared to a computer vision community, it took like probably three more years for NLP community to find a universally useful pre-training task or language domain. So one of the um, key achievements in the, um, in the early days is ELMO, 
which is actually released, which was actually uh, won the 2018 NACL best paper. And you can think of this as a contextual word embedding. It was actually advert advertised this way. The title also is the contextual word representation. So what they were aiming to do was that they wanted to contextualize each word embedding so that now these words have richer word embeddings, but they still wanted the people to use this in the same way as the word embeddings. That's they, how they sold, sold this model too. So um, because people use like glove vectors or um, for instance, word to vec vectors for their target task. But what Emma was saying is that, um, okay, but use ours, which is contextualized. And of course the bad thing is that you have to compute this every time because it's contextualized, unlike word embeddings. But then the good thing is that this is a plug, in, uh, plug and play module that which can be just plugged into any kind of task that uses word embedding. And the good, and also is that basically this will boost your target model, target task models performance by a lot. Actually it did. So please feel free to check this out. I mean, the, the paper out if you're interested. Uh, back then, they were basically showing a lot of improvements in the, the tasks that people were interested, like um, squad or NER or core FS resolution by like three, four, five percent improvement without any other change except replacing the word embeddings. And um, a few months later, uh, well, the ULM fit, ULM fit was proposed. And what they were trying to do is that they wanted to create a language model with LSTM. Actually, I forgot to mention that. So Elma was using LSTMs, by the way, for language models. So you see her language LSTM, they're using LSTM. So it's very simple LSTM, but the, the important thing is that also it's bi-directional. So they have one language model in the forward direction and they have one language model in the backward direction and they just concatenate their outputs. And though that output basically is they're saying the contextualized word embeddings. And then ULM FIT stands for Universal Language Model Fine Tuning. So they basically had a language model with LSTM. That's actually very similar to Elmo. But the difference was that instead of uh, having some task specific model on top of these, so which is basically what Elmo was doing because they were selling Elmo as a contextualized embedding. They were basically arguing that they can use this language model directly for the target task with a very minimal layer, which is basically just one layer at the top, for instance, just uh, for this class fiction layer. And actually, I think this is one of the first cases that uh, the, that showed um, language model itself can be tuned with a minimal task specific layer. But then the, um, I don't think it got, it got a lot of attention, but I don't think it got enough attention that it uh, did, deserves, especially because it only focused on the classification task. Whereas um, people were more interested in NLP community, more interest in uh, token level ta classification tasks, like for instance, squad, QAs, NERs, these things, preference. So um, that was a, but then it was basically one of the first models that actually were proposing that you can just tune the model itself without any task specific layer. And certainly, um, wait, okay, this is actually something that I'm not used. Um, and then also a few months later, or maybe even a few weeks later, uh, GPT was introduced by the OpenAI. And basically it stands for generative pre-training. And you can think of this as ULM fit plus transformer. In the fact that there is no task specific layer. Remember that ULM fit was using LSTM, but then transform was recently, back then was doing pretty well in many tasks. So they thought that why don't we replace LSTM with transformer? And one of the things that they introduced for the first time was actually concatenating all the inputs that if there are multiple inputs with delimiters, because the models will be able to actually distinguish between um, these different inputs if they're trained well enough. 
So they just basically put like these delimiters here. You see these things. If you have multiple inputs, now that basically enabled people to think of this as more of a, okay, uh, we just have one input, which is a sequence. We don't have to think about anything else. We don't have to think about having multiple inputs, which will basically complicate the model structure. Which is very obvious these days, but back then it wasn't at all. Actually, people thought that they should have a dedicated uh, input channel for multiple inputs. But GPT also only focused on the text classification. And I think that's also why GPT uh, didn't get enough attention that it deserved. Um, although, of course, it got a lot of attention too. So I think it's worth note uh, at this point, it's worth noting what happened each, um, wh what happened, I think, when this each, each of these models was proposed. So Transform was first available on archive in May 2017. Elmo was actually released on the archive later, but then this was, I think everyone knew about this because of the leaderboard, like squad leader, it was actually winning the squad leaderboard by November, 2017. So um, maybe these two models are actually kind of a concurrent work. But then um, Elmo and ULM Fit was around late 2017 and early 2018. And then GPT observing these recent advancements, it was released in June 2018. But GPT, again, I told you that the, it was only focusing on the classification and also it wasn't really you know, trying to do really large scale. It was actually trained on single node, eight GPUs back then. And in fact, single node training was dominant even for the pre-training and especially in LP, uh, I, I, it, it's these days you think that NLP actually requires more, but many more GPUs than Vision. But then, uh, like three to four years ago, people were saying that you should do NLP if you don't have enough GPUs. Um, you, you should do Vision only if, if you have a lot of GPUs. That's what people were saying back then because pe people rarely used like uh, entire node. They usually train on like one or two GPUs, for instance. And of course, the reason also was that most organizations, including OpenAI back then, didn't have the capacity or willingness to deploy multi-node training. Um, and uh, I think uh, some people were surely interested in Elmo plus GPT plus scale. Basically Elmo, in a sense that um, using these pre-training for not just classification, not just text classification, but the token level classification or any kind of a, uh, interesting classification that NLP people were interested in. and GPT in a sense that using transformer and then just using one concatenate input and of course scale because they just had scale. So uh, I think the everyone knows what the answer is. So this is basically what we're going to talk about in the next uh, lecture, uh, Bert. So yeah, I think um, that'll be it for today's lecture. So thanks a lot. I'll see you on Thursday with the lab session, which will be probably focusing on mostly in the Ngram language model. Um, not the quiz, the quiz will be covering, I think some of maybe in the transfer learning, but uh, the lab will be mostly about the Ngram language model. Um, so, okay, see you on Thursday. Thanks a lot.